Welcome to another special edition episode of Last Week in Quantum. This is the show where we review the top news in the world of quantum computing and its impact on the world's cybersecurity, AI, and more. I'm your host, Rebecca Krafner, and today we have an expert in the field of quantum and emerging tech, Laura Thomas. Laura E. Thomas is the former chief of staff and current advisor to Inflection, one of the most exciting quantum technology companies that's merging quantum sensing and quantum computing. Laura is also super well known in the quantum space for her unique perspectives that she gained as a former CIA case officer and chief of base who led sensitive CIA programs at CIA headquarters and abroad in multiple international assignments. She served over 18 years in various national security and leadership roles, working with partners across the IC, uh, National Security Council, U.S. Department of Defense, and with foreign partners. Uh, Laura, it's always awesome to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So we'll kick it off today. Uh, New story came out yesterday. Illinois lands federal partnership to further develop quantum projects. And so this this news is about how the how DARPA or the Defense uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency will take residency on the uh, on Illinois soon to be constructed quantum campus to establish a program where quantum computing prototypes will be tested to bolster national security. Laura, given your background um, working in the CIA, working with the government and working in national security, um, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, it's great news. I mean, it's phenomenal. I'm so happy to, to hear that more money is being directed this way. It's, it's desperately needed when we think about just how much money that China is spending on this technology and how much of a game changer this technology is going to be uh, once it's, you know, once it's really put into practice. Uh, th- this... It, it can't come soon enough. And, you know, I wish this sort of funding was enacted years ago, but, you know, we have to start from where we are and, and let's get going. Uh, I know a lot of companies out there are eager to, to really work with the U S government and prove out their, their technologies and really show the power and the potential of quantum and prove that, you know, it's not just a, a research project, not just a science project, but something that is very applicable and has real world applications to include those in the national security sector. And it's also great. I mean, DARPA is essentially what built Silicon Valley. So Mm -hmm. it's great that DARPA is stepping up. Uh, They've done other funding before in quantum. So it's not like this is brand new that they've, they've never played in quantum. Certainly they have, but the fact that they're putting 140 million in is great. I would argue that that is a little bit of pocket change considering how expensive it is to build quantum hardware. So I hope that there's more of that coming. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I know we've talked about um, the, I mean, building quantum computers is capital intensive and uh, the the need, it's great that they're putting money in. It's great that the government is is, is funding and encouraging growth, growth in the quantum sector, um, but the need for more and, and, and how do we inspire more? And I think, the last time that uh, I saw you in person was, man, almost two years ago at South by Southwest. Yeah, it was, it was South by Southwest, yeah. It was, it was at South by Southwest. And, yep. uh, and you were speaking on, I think, on the, the government side, um, government and quantum. And I think what, what you're, you've always been really excellent at is explaining um, to, at, at that level that's very accessible, how people should think about it, um, people broadly, but um, I'd, I'd like to ask you, you know, if, if you were talking to policymakers um, and you were explaining to them the, the urgency and the need for more and more and more uh, to be put into developing this ecosystem, what do you think is currently sort of missing from, from that understanding um, at, a, at a policymaker level? Yeah, this is a technology. I mean, there will be quantum enabled warfare at some point. In, in my lifetime, we better be ready for it. And with quantum enabled warfare, there's quantum computing and then there's quantum sensing. Quantum sensing is likely going to come sooner. Quantum sensors already exist. There are certain ways that our adversaries, namely China, that's really the, the one that is our pacing partner, can use this technology to essentially uh, out navigate us, um, out uh, basically position us because there's this entire field of quantum is related to positioning, navigation, and timing. In addition, there's the entire field of quantum computing where you think about eventually the Chinese being able to break encryption. This is all a huge threat. And we have to be doing the right things now to prepare ourselves and the warfighter to make sure that they are ready and able 
if we lose the capability for GPS, which is absolutely the first thing we think that the Chinese are going to do in a true war situation, we lose logistics for our military. We lose the ability to uh, figure out where our troops are and those troops communicating with each other. Uh, we potentially lose our financial system. Uh, all the communication that we uh, love dearly as far as just even navigating, think about Google Maps, everything you do nowadays, usually there is some GPS component of it. We lose all of that very quickly. So now is the time to really invest and make sure that this is a technology that we have not just first mover advantage on, but like by leaps and bounds. And we still have that. The, the great news is in the U.S., the U.S. is still ahead in this technology. But the problem is China is closing that gap incredibly quickly. And that's because as a, as a state, as a state that sort of combines military and civil affairs, they can move so much faster. They can put so much funding into this. They can direct their industries to do certain things. We don't want to be China to be China here in the U.S., but we do have to do things differently. It goes back to when you think about how we eventually built the semiconductor industry. I mean, all of that was because the U.S. government was buying semiconductors. And this is the old days, way back uh, in Silicon Valley, U.S. was buying semiconductors. They were being a good customer. And we need the U.S. government to be a good customer and actually buy the quantum products that are being built now to spur that industry and to be able to beat China. That's ultimately what it comes down to. And there's the entire national security angle of this, but then there's the economic prosperity angle of this. That is also national security in many ways, too. So to a policymaker, now is the time. We're not moving fast enough. Our adversaries are moving incredibly fast. We're still ahead, but we're losing our pole position, and we need to change that. Yeah, yeah, here, here. Um, I, you know, I work on the cybersecurity side, and, and we talk a lot about. I think in the in the media, there's there's a lot of emphasis on the um, the amazing things that that at some point in the hopefully near future we'll be able to do with uh, with quantum processing, um, and perhaps not enough on the 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 flip side, right? We talk about um, potential attacks on critical infrastructure or, um, you know, there's, there's some, some studies that say a single quantum computing attack on one of the top five banks in the U S could lead to like a over a trillion dollars cascading, um, uh, cascading losses. And, uh, and it's, it's just, it's like nuclear, right? Um, if you have a really powerful technology, that technology can be used both for good and for, for nefarious purposes. And so, um, yeah, totally, totally hear you. I, um, I ask you a question, understand maybe, maybe you can't answer, but um, I've heard sort of, I think, secondhand about how you actually made the transition into, into quantum. Can you talk a little bit about that and what first inspired you to, to, to take up the, the quantum mantle? Yeah, I was, uh, I'm, I'll have to figure out, uh, let me think about moderating my comments a little bit <laughs> because it was a scenario where I was at CIA and I was running an operation. Um, ultimately what it came down to is I was, I was nervous about, you know, what is it about this operation that could be discoverable in the future, um, specifically by adversaries that have immense um, technological capabilities. And it led me to asking uh, a fellow officer who was uh, focused on science and technology, what is it about encryption that we are so confident in, you know, why is it that we, we believe that it, it will withstand, you know, the test of at least near term time? And he's, he basically said, oh, you know, it would take thousands of years sometimes for a computer to do this. I said, well, what would change that assumption? And he said, well, a quantum computer. I said, well, what is that? I had no idea what a quantum computer was. I'd never heard of it. And he said, well, they don't really exist yet. Sort, I mean, they sort of exist, but not really. They're not powerful enough. And I said, well, this sounds like something that we should be paying attention to. And he said, yeah, probably. And that just, that got me worried and thinking. And um, I went down a long rabbit hole researching quantum, you know, all the way from, look, there's a lot of hype in the industry, no doubt. But but talking to some of the foremost experts and, and really seeing how they have changed their position over time as different milestones have been met with quantum hardware. Mm -hmm. And uh, it led me to, to ultimately deciding this is what I want to do. I want to jump into the quantum industry. I want to figure out how I can help uh, an early industry, a nascent industry gain traction. 
and hopefully help the national security mission as well. It's, that's awesome. And I think the, the whole quantum ecosystem is glad that you, you jumped in. Um, and to wrap up, uh, what is one piece, one thing that you'd want to leave the audience with? And particularly if we imagine that we're talking to people who do have influence on policymaking, what's, what's the one thing you want them to know about either the current state of quantum, where we're going, what would you leave them with? We really need to focus in the U.S. on two things in the quantum industry. One is supply chain. We have to be able to own our supply chain in the U.S. if we really want to make sure that we can build quantum products in the, the volume and with the security that we need to, to make sure that we're winning against our adversaries. Currently, we don't have that. That is a major, major problem. A lot of the quantum component makers, these are mom and pop garage shop folks, or they're sourced from overseas, particularly China in a lot of cases. That is not sustainable. That's the first thing from a policy standpoint. Second thing, it goes back to the funding. Uh, you know, a lot of the startups, they are not looking for handouts. They're not necessarily looking for grants. Don't get me wrong. What company is going to walk away if someone says, hey, I'll give you $5 million to do whatever. Great. But actually, that doesn't make you exercise business muscle. A lot of the companies that I know, and specifically at Inflection, we want to exercise business muscle. We want to we want to be a real company, um, not a government handout, and definitely not a super mill. So let's compete on milestones. Put milestones in front of us and say, you know what? If you get to this milestone, we're going to fund you then at this amount. And then when you hit that this next milestone, we're going to fund you at this amount. Like that's the way to really make sure that the incentives are aligned, that people are not wasting taxpayer dollars. The hype is cut down. Um, if you don't meet the milestone, then you don't you don't move forward because there are a lot of companies out there that are going to be competing. We want competition in the U.S. That's wonderful, um, but but we have got to get our act together as far as the way we fund startups. And you know, when you look at some of the big companies out there, they have these huge lobbying arms. They're on Capitol Hill all the time. Very small companies. They just can't they can't afford to do that. You know, we do what we can, but there needs to be a, a, a voice in the industry that goes out and helps lawmakers in particular, understand what the startup environment is like, what how startups get funded, how do they manage from quarter to quarter, and then how does government money flow into that and impact their decision making, especially if these startups are focused on national security. And if one or, you know, heaven forbid, 10 of these startups fail, or worse, they're sold off piecemeal to China in some form, what is the implications for the industry? And we can't let that happen. And that's where really sound industrial policy that's not being China to beat China matters. Yeah, as a, as a startup person, I love, I love that message. And I like that idea of milestones. So everybody who's listening, think about that, take that into consideration. And I am all for that. Thank you, Laura. It was awesome. Today, and I will look forward to seeing you in person next yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.